Okay, hello. welcome everyone. Welcome to the Blue Coast Masterclass. Really excited to have everyone here. I wanted to have this masterclass to get everyone together, get everyone talking about glucose and why it matters, because this is just really what disease boils down to. If we have glucose and insulin that is out of whack, that is out of control, you're going to have disease. And when we balance that, a lot of things get better. Now, not everything, there is still gut health, stealth infections, mold, heavy metals, hormones, but if you have a stable blood sugar, it's going to make everything else so much easier. So a little bit about me, I'm a wife, a mother of four. I love Jesus. I am board certified in emergency medicine and integrative medicine. I am a national speaker. I travel around to speak at different conferences and I have a podcast, the integrative health podcast with Dr. Jen. And I am also a summit host and I have a peptide summit coming up in May. So just be on the lookout for that. It's going to be really awesome. And I also had an autoimmune disease. I had Hashimoto's. I contracted it most likely in high school and they didn't even test for it. They didn't even find out until I had my thyroid, partial thyroidectomy, which is crazy. So my passion is to um, save people from conventional medicine. So you guys can put in the chat, you know, does anyone have these symptoms? Does anyone have fatigue, irritability, weight gain, anxiety, depression, hormone imbalance, gut problems, hypoglycemia, problems sleeping? Yes. All of these symptoms can be the root cause. It can be glucose and insulin resistance and problems maintaining a glucose. And we see this with hypoglycemia a lot. You how could you have high blood sugar if you have hypoglycemia? And I try to explain this to people. And once you explain it to them, and I'll show you guys on some curves, some glucose curves, once you know how to fix this, you're not going to be on that roller coaster anymore. And you feel better when your blood sugar is balanced. I don't know about anyone else, but I made the mistake of getting those Cadbury eggs, those little ones, you know, with the shells on them. And I'm like, I'll just get one bag for my kids and share them, you know, just so I'm not like a grumpy mom, just so, you know, my kids don't think that I'm a Scrooge. Well, I, I, we had them open. I was eating them throughout the day and I was wearing a continuous glucose monitor and I was just on a roller coaster. And what was my mood? I was grumpy. I was grumpy. So, um, I'm actually like doing a sugar cleanse this week cause I'm over it. Like, nope. So what makes the biggest difference? So mindset, mindset makes the biggest difference and committing to, to yourself and just think, you know, I get to do this. I get to control my blood sugar. I get to feel good. A lot of the times we look at nutrition changes as a negative. We're bummed out. We're like, oh, I can't get ice cream with the kids. Well, you can swap out Greek yogurt with some good protein powder instead in there, and your blood sugar is going to be more balanced, yet it still tastes good. You know, you can make that ice cream with cottage cheese. I, I still haven't done that, but I mean, there's different things you can do, and you're not going to feel like you're missing out as much. You can still splurge every once in a while, and I'll give you some trips, tricks on how to be able to splurge and not have it ruin your week. So you're going to change your life. You're going to prevent disease. Once you get your mindset on the fact that you want to control your blood glucose, that this is an important thing to do. This is life-changing. So many Americans have type two diabetes. We, we don't want you to become a number. We want to prevent that ahead of time. And this is another mindset. Like I love this Bible verse from second Corinthians nine, six, remember this, whoever sows sparingly also reaps sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. So if you put the work in, you know, if you are kind, you get kindness back, you know, all of those things. So just have the mindset of prosperity and abundance that you're going to, to do good. And you will get that same energy back. Don't give up after one bad week or one bad meal, just keep going at it. It's going to take time. 
So I do want to present at this masterclass. I will present you with an offer at the end of the masterclass. And for those of you live, you will get a hefty discount. And this will include an introductory session with me. Then we will get labs that will be included, two courses that will be included. We're going to review labs. We'll have the courses and more supplements, a follow-up session. We'll review things like continuous glucose monitor. I'll put you to the test, maybe challenge you a little bit, and then we'll do a wrap-up session. So this is about an eight-week program, but depending on your schedule, it can be extended out a little bit. So let's talk about definitions, just because I think this will equip you if you are a conventional doctor or just talking to other people. So glucose, it's a sugar, a monosaccharide sugar, and it's mostly in plant and animal tissue, and it circulates in our blood, and it's our major energy source. Now, our other energy source is ketones, and ketones are awesome too. I feel great when I'm on ketones, as long as I'm drinking my electrolytes and staying hydrated. But glucose, it's it's kind of you know what we're used to burning our bodies. But what's nice is when we can go out of glucose just glucose burning and into ketosis. And that's metabolic flexibility. That's the ideal. That's really what you want to get to. So insulin is a polypeptide hormone. It is a peptide and it's secreted by the islets of Landerhine and that's in the pancreas. And they function in the metabolism of carbohydrates and fats and the conversion of glucose to glycogen. And this helps maintain a blood glucose level. A continuous glucose monitor is known as a CGM. You will hear a lot of people say, talk about that. And it's a tool, you put it in your arm usually, sometimes you can put it in the subcutaneous tissue in the belly. And this gives a continuous reading of glucose. And the glucose reading in the subcutaneous tissues, it mainly pretty correlates pretty well with blood glucose levels in the blood. Mine's always a little higher in my, in my tissues. A blood glucose spike is a sudden rise in blood glucose, which leads to a large insulin spike. And we want to minimize those spikes. So a big glucose spike also means big insulin spike because insulin is trying to shuttle that glucose circulating around in the blood into muscles, tissue, and into cells. Diabetes is a chronic disease, and this is when the pancreas doesn't produce enough insulin or the body becomes insulin resistant and it doesn't do anything with the insulin levels being high. So we see this a lot in type two, but diabetics where they have these chronically high insulin levels and they're it's damaging tissues, wrecking havoc, and then they start having blood glucose out of control because the glucose is stuck in the blood. Then you get things like frequent urination, um, increased thirst, all of the symptoms of newly diagnosed diabetes. However, we're missing like a 10 year window here, five to 10 year window where we can reverse that. And I've had a lot of type two diabetics that have even gotten off all their meds, like working with me, it's been great. And diabetes causes a lot of end organ tissue damage. So blindness, that affects your eyes, kidney failure, heart attack, stroke, and lower limb amputation because of the lack of blood flow, because that high, chronically high insulin levels have damaged those blood vessels. Hypoglycemia glycemia is abnormally low blood sugar, and this is resulting from excessive insulin. So this happens after a blood sugar spike. So you're your glucose spikes, but your insulin spiking and it kind of overshoots it because it's trying to protect you, your body from damage. So then you fall too low and then you get shaky and feel bad and anxious. Hyperglycemia is raised blood sugar. And this, you know, with uncontrolled diabetes over time, this is what damages the blood vessels. And then insulin resistance, this is where we can catch insulin resistance progression or insulin, our insulin resistance to full on diabetes. And this is an impaired response to insulin stimulation of the target tissue. This is mainly in the liver muscle and then adipose tissue. And this progression leads to metabolic syndrome and then non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And NASH also is included in that and type two diabetes and NASH and NAFLD, the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, it is surpassing alcoholic cirrhosis, um, for, for actual liver failure. And I think that's a really scary statistic. 
Here's an example of a continuous glucose monitor. This was mine. And, um, you know, this, you will get sometimes from a fasted workout that glucagon release from the liver, and then you go back to baseline. Um, let's see, I, I had another spike and then it continued to be high because I was baking. I think this was around Christmas and I was having some, let's see, some frosting, sampling, frosting, eating dough. But I recognized that I didn't want it to be so crazy. So I did have a protein shake in there. This was very interesting. So stress can really affect our blood glucose. And we'll talk about one of the strategies to keep it low is to, to have mindfulness almost up to like 175 because like we had a tornado warning and I was like running around. We were in a camper at midnight. That's, that's when we were like running for our lives, trying to find the shelter. It was crazy. And then do you see that big spike? And then how I bottomed out. And then, um, that's my normal, you know, where it's just all day. It's, it's fine. This is one of the reasons why I love continuous glucose monitors, grain-free chips. I, I cannot eat them plain. Cassava spiked me up and stayed high. And then I was kind of on a roller coaster the rest of the day. So when I have my CDA chips, I pair them with protein. I pair them with guacamole, even salsa is going to be better. Um, and that's going to help blunt that spike. So this is a case study I wanted to include this, a patient that I have was working with was using their continuous glucose monitor and they were, you know, playing around with drinking orange juice with it. And then they also compared to that to eating a, an actual orange. They got a huge spike with the fruit juice, which I am not a big fan of fruit juice. You're going to have that really big spike when you eat the whole food you're going to have less of a spike and you still are getting sugar and you will still see spikes. Grapes tend to be the worst. Honestly, berries are the best. And with the juice, you have this big spike. If you eat the whole fruit, you're not going to have as big of a spike because the fiber is going to slow down that absorption of the sugar. So some alternatives for if you want juice and you want to go to the trendy juice shop, then have green juice. Try to not have spinach in the green juice but you can have green juice and just, you don't want a lot of apple or pear in it. You don't, you don't really need that. Honestly, romaine lettuce is sweet on its own. So I really like those green juices with romaine, some pop alternatives, cause pop, you're going to have that same crash and burn. Olipop, you can have sparkling water. You can have herbal tea. So now we're going to talk about tips and tricks. You know, you might be thinking, Dr. Jen, I know I have a blood glucose problem. I can feel it. I'm tired. Or if you're over like 40, you do have a glucose problem. We just get more and more insulin resistant. Um, as we're, you know, losing estrogen because estradiol makes us more insulin sensitive, but, but even so I, I found with my patients, women, even over the age of 35, we just do not tolerate white sugar or white flour. So we're going to go through all of these. We're going to work on our four pillars of health, eat protein and fat with every meal, vegetables with fiber to start a meal, dance party squats or a walk after large meals, build muscle to increase insulin sensitivity, supplements to help with blood sugar, apple cider vinegar and berberine are great. And remember, sugar is addictive, so you need to eat it responsibly. And Hippocrates, why is Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine and let medicine be thy food. We cannot expect to feel good and live long and have longevity if we are eating the standard American diet, which is called the sad diet. It's just, you got to throw that out. And it doesn't mean that you can't ever eat out or have fun or, or go and get ice cream. I, I do all those things, but then you have to rein it back in, right? You just can't like let it go on a snowball effect. So the four pillars of health are nutrition, sleep, movement, and breath work. So when we talk about movement and exercise, some people get a little bit, you know, upset about this because exercise is a stressor and it will bump your blood sugar as I showed you with my graph, but it usually comes back down and that's a nice hormesis. However, we do want to balance cortisol. A lot of the times um, people will be going to a certain gym that maybe has splat points. 
And I don't want anyone to get mad at me, but, and they're doing these hit workouts every day and it's crashing their adrenals and, oh, it's just, it, it messes with their hormones. So I, I do not think that that is a good idea. If you want to do hit workouts, keep it a once a week. If you are having some sort of crisis, health crisis, autoimmune disease, you feel like crap. No, like do restorative stuff. You don't need to get splat points. That's not, not good. So I recommend, especially if you're in a healing crisis or you think something is off, you know, with your hormones, with your blood sugar, weightlifting minimum three, three times per week, you could do it five times a week and do different areas for different days. Um, I put at the bottom, you know, Heather Robinson, Caroline Givern, um, HossFit. Those are my three favorite channels. I did Heather Robinson's like her shoulders this morning and my shoulders are so sore and I just was at home. Um, also we'll, we'll talk about cycle syncing a little bit, but luteal phase, you, you don't want to be doing a bunch of hit workouts. It's going to tank your progesterone. So not worth it. Um, swimming's also good. Just make sure you're rinsing off the chloride because that could affect your iodine levels. Eat protein and fat with every meal. So you'd be surprised how many people don't do this. And you could go to restaurants and look at the menu and it's just like carbs, right? Like pasta and marinara sauce or French fries and a veggie burger, you know, carbs, that's a lot of carbs. So make sure you're focusing on protein and we want that 30 grams of protein. We want that really nice nutrient dense protein. And, you know, I, I just, there's no, you can't argue the fact that like animal protein, there's been studies, it's more dense with nutrients than if you're eating vegan, like rice and beans, you know, and you're getting all the amino acids that you need to build muscle. So a guide to fats, what to eat and what to avoid. So I want to go over these in detail because I have a little asterisks there. So olive oil, butter, macadamia nut oil, coconut oil, lard or tallow, avocado oil. Those are going to be good fats. Um, avocados are good fats in general. I, I have talked about this before. Avocado oil can be tainted. It can be adultered, meaning they could put uh, like canola oil in it and sell it as avocado oil. I mean, these companies are shady, right? So I would, you know, I like getting lard and tallow from small farms and cooking with them. Olive oil is great. And then butter. I love butter. Um, palm oil and peanut oil. If you're going to get like packaged snacks or um, have, you know, fries, have fries fried in lard um, or peanut oil is going to be your best bet. And palm oil, like in like those good crisps that are like Pringles, that's a better bet than like the sunflower oil. Why? Because they are more heat stable. So they're not going to go rancid. Okay. Those two are good at high temperatures compared to um, the red side, the thumbs down, soybean oil, canola oil, sunflower oil, grapeseed oil, sunflower oil is in there twice because I think it's so bad, I guess. Cottonseed oil, safflower oil, corn oil, and expeller pressed anything because you're still pressing it down and that pressing creates heat still. So what is 30 grams of protein? You know, I've been saying 30 grams of protein is good with each meal. So about 20 grams of protein is what activates that growth of muscle. If you're trying to grow muscle, which we all should be because we are losing muscle. So some of that protein is lost in digestion. So that's why 30 grams of protein is a good amount. This is an example of all the ways you can get animal-based protein sources and what is about 30 grams. So I like to, I really like as a treat for dessert tonight, I had Greek yogurt with the strawberry protein powder from Just Ingredients and it was so good. It was so good. It tasted like ice cream even even better. So, and I was getting lots of protein. Here's plant-based sources. As you can see, you have to have a lot more to get 30 grams. And some of these could have, um, you know, anti-nutrients in it, oxalates, um, things like that. So chickpeas, for example, two cups is 30 grams. 
I don't know how many people are having that many chickpeas. So use these as, as just an addition. I, I don't know. I think it would be hard to get protein just focusing on plant-based sources. You could have hummus made with olive oil and that's really nice fat and fiber and protein with veggies and then have some salmon also tofu if it's like legit tofu and not junk tofu then go for it but you're not really finding clean clean things if you go out to eat and get tofu at a restaurant oops sorry about that okay veggies with fiber to start a meal this is a study in diabetic medicine showed that eating vegetables before carbohydrates resulted in postprandial glucose levels that were decreased. And the study was using a continuous glucose monitor. And it concluded this was would help patients prevent cardiovascular disease. If you're having that vegetable first, that's going to slow the absorption of those carbohydrates. Because when your body digests carbohydrates, boom, you're going to get a big insulin response to that. So when you're eating the vegetables, we want them to be starchy vegetables like broccoli. You could do cauliflower rice. You could do a nice salad with arugula, carrots, broccoli, coleslaw, um, Brussels sprouts, sauerkraut and kimchi are even better because you're getting some probiotics in there, along with the prebiotic of the fiber. So the order in which you eat your food matters. So say you are out to eat and you get a plate and it has broccoli, mashed potatoes, and steak on it. So you're going to eat the broccoli first, then you're going to eat your steak, and then you're going to have your mashed potatoes. Also, this means save dessert for last. So it's totally fine to have dessert or have a cookie if you if you can handle it and you'd want to test it with your continuous glucose monitor but if you have it at the end of the meal it's going to be less of a shock to your system so say you you really want a cookie or you know some ice cream you've been just thinking about a treat right it might even be a healthy treat and you want it like right after you get back from work you're like oh my goodness i just want to eat that now hold off or have some carrots have some vegetables and then have it. So that is going to help reduce those spikes. Also better to eat your carbs, um, not super late at night. That's, that's also can be hard on your system and affect your sleep. You definitely want to move after a meal, especially if it's a high carb meal that yeah, turkey and Thanksgiving dinner and all of that. It's a little bit of the trip to fame, but it's mostly just because you're overeating if you would get up and go for a walk, um, you know, do the dishes, clean your house, do your laundry, then move. Even if you don't want to, even if you feel like, oh, food coma, that's what people say, food coma. Yeah, that's your blood glucose level, not good level and your insulin. And that's going to make you become more insulin resistant if you have more and more of those episodes. So exercise increases glucose tolerance by facilitating muscle glucose uptake through a non-insulin dependent mechanism. And that brings us to really important building muscle to increase insulin sensitivity. So we just said movement helps after a meal because it helps insulin sensitivity because you're pushing that glucose into the muscles. So what if you had more muscle, right? You have more place for that glucose to go. My patients, especially my women, they do so well when they start lifting and when they start building muscle. I've been lifting really heavy weights the last um, two years, but I would say more really heavy, like, you know, over in the free weight area of the gym in the last year. And I can eat more or I can have more times where I'm like, oh, I'm kind of eating a lot and it's, it's okay because my metabolism's higher because I have so much muscle and it's helping my glucose spikes. It's helping to prevent me from having diabetes and dementia, which is type three diabetes. And it's helping my hormone health. So skeletal muscles show that studies have shown that skeletal muscle, more skeletal muscle mass, the better the glucose levels. We know this. So lifting heavy and a lot of people are worried about lifting that they're going to look bulky 
I mean, you would have to try really hard and be on testosterone <laughs> to really look bulky. Like you're not going to look like a man unless you have testosterone or excess testosterone, which if you start looking manly when you're lifting, well, maybe we should see what your hormone levels are. If you are going down the androgen pathway hard and you need some adjustment. And the great thing is, is you're already eating a lot of protein. So that will help with your muscle strength gain. And this is the, the strength you're going to age better. The more muscle you have that super skinny look without muscles that is not in anymore. No one wants that. Did you know that after the age of 40 adults may lose about one to 2% of their muscle mass per year? That is terrible. And the older you get, the harder it is to gain muscle back. This is why when, you know, the elderly, they go to the hospital, they break their hip or whatever, or they have a fall and then they lose that muscle. And then they just go downhill since, since then, well, they're losing muscle mass. It's hard to gain back their, their glucose is probably out of whack and they're probably inflamed because they they lost so much muscle. And this process is age-related muscle loss is referred to as sarcopenia. Muscle is a longevity organ. We need to have muscle. Supplements that help blood sugar are apple cider vinegar and berberine. And I'll drop these links here in a moment. Apple cider vinegar has been shown in studies to help decrease postprandial glucose levels when consumed before a meal. So the dosage is one tablespoon about 20 minutes before eating. So this can be in water. It could be a low sugar gummy recipe. I'm not a big fan of, unless they're like for kids, those apple cider vinegar gummies, cause they have a sugar in them. So that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. You could make your own low sugar gummy, or you could just have it in water. I like to have apple cider vinegar salad dressing. So you can put that on the salad dressing ahead of time. That will also help. And then berberine. Berberine is an herbal supplement that has been shown to be helpful with insulin resistant. And it also, it maintains healthy blood glucose levels through activation of AMP kinase. And that helps with long-term and short-term metabolic changes. This is happening within the mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of our cell. It's how we get our energy. So AMP, AMP kinase or AMP K improves insulin sensitivity, and then also down-regulating genes involved with fat storage while activating genes with fat burning. Berberine, I dose this for patients three capsules before your largest meal. We have to remember sugar is addictive. We have to eat it responsibly. And this study showed that sugar substance reduces opiate and dopamine and thus must be expected to have an addictive potential. And it's the same reward system center of the brain as cocaine. So this makes it highly addictive. And the problem with sugar is it's added to all of our food, especially during the low fat craze. So what did they replace fat with sugar? It's terrible. That's kind of when the obesity um, epidemic got even worse. And I was, I thought that when I got low fat stuff, I was doing the right thing in the, in the nineties, the two thousands, you know, you're like, Oh, it's low fat, 90 calories. It's full of sugar and carbs. What make you most fat? Be better off eating some butter. So the problem with sugar is that you're going to have those big spikes it's usually refined bleach sugar. If you're going to have sugar to cook with or as a substitute and ingredients to look at, if you're you know on the go and need a bar or something, coconut sugar, honey, and maple syrup, they're healthier, but they're still probably going to spike your blood sugar. So you can check those with your continuous glucose monitor. Sugar swaps. I love allulose. I love allulose with baking. I just made a high protein cheesecake. And for the kids, and I used allulose and they ate it. They didn't know. I didn't tell them it wasn't real sugar. <laughs> Stevia and monk fruit I like. So I, I don't like erythritol. It makes me bloated. It's a sugar alcohol. And then it was 
you know, linked to cardiovascular effects. So erythritol, it's in a lot of keto products. I'm not a fan. I avoid erythritol. And then um, sucralose, aspartame, all of those are nonsense, no good chemicals. What do you do if you have a sugar craving? These are real because when we have stress, our body is going to crave sugar. Our body is going to crave sugar all the time because it used to be non-readily available, right? And, and your body's kind of like wants to be lazy. Our, <laughs> our body can be like, okay, if you just have sugar, I don't have to like make ketones or or tap the liver for glyco glycogen to convert to glucose. So you're, you're going to crave it. But once you pull it out of your diet for about three, it's two days is usually enough, but three days for sure, you're not really going to have those cravings as much unless you keep having it. So it just is it's like you're feeding a monster if you keep having sugar. So you could try the 478 breath. That is a great technique to activate the vagal nerve. It's going to calm you down. You inhale for four, hold for seven, and exhale for eight. And you do that three times. I love this breathwork technique. You're holding your breath, you're breathing in and holding. That diaphragm is going to stretch, and that's going to activate that vagal nerve, that vagus nerve that runs through the diaphragm. You could drink a glass of water, clean water. Don't drink out of plastic water bottle. Or have a cup of organic herbal tea. You can go for a walk outside. You can ground. You can play with your kids. It will pass. I really think drinking something or you could drink some electrolytes. I like Redmond. I like LMNT. That's helpful too because it's sometimes even like when it comes to fasting, it's just you need to like be drinking, doing something. So that's really helpful. The order of the meal. So I really like this slide. So first, oh, apple cider vinegar. That's a new one. No, it's supposed to be apple cider vinegar. One tablespoon your vegetables. And then if you see to the right, there's nice olive oil there. You could even make an olive oil, apple cider vinegar dressing, which is really good. Then you want to have protein and fat, cook that steak in nice butter or tallow, put some Redmond salt on there, then carbohydrates. Then you can have your sweet potato would be better than a white potato. More vegetables would be good, would be better. Just depending on what you're going Going, trying to do if it's luteal phase and you need a little bit more carbohydrates, have that sweet potato. If it's follicular phase or you're postmenopausal and you're trying, you're going to be more low carb, then have some cauliflower rice, have some extra veggies, have some broccoli, which is great for estrogen metabolism. And then dessert, if needed, would be last. Some swaps, you know, for those nasty like frozen drink, cappuccino, frappuccinos, like a million calorie drinks, <laughs> moldy coffee. Anyway, you could switch it for an inflama shake, some sort of protein shake, something that's anti-inflammatory, something that's pro-aging, regular potato chips, fried in nasty oils. You could have pork rinds. So I thought that they would be disgusting. And you know, five years ago, I started eating them and I like them. You have to be like in a mood for pork rinds, but that's a really good clean brand. In smoothies, bananas, probably going to spike your blood sugar. I think I do okay when I have enough fat. If I do use a banana base, if I put a lot of peanut butter in it or nut butter, then I can get away with it. But otherwise, no. I love avocados or cauliflower rice in smoothies and it makes it smooth. The cauliflower rice is, is really great. That makes it more like drinkable. The avocado is going to make it more like a mousse, like a dessert. It's really good. French fries, sweet potato, sweet potato fries, even, you know, like swap them out. You're going to get a little bit more nutrient dense there. And potatoes are nightshades and regular potatoes. And a lot of people are sensitive to them. Instead of cookies, swap them out for berries. Berries are going to have a lower glycemic impact than other fruit. Grapes, just, oof, they're rough on people's monitors, continuous glucose monitors. All right, who wants to talk about fasting? I love talking about fasting. So why fast? 
Fasting helps with weight loss and fat loss because you're reducing caloric intake. Insulin sensitivity, really, really helpful. So fasting or fasting mimicking diets, great for insulin sensitivity, could really change things around, especially for diabetic insulin resistant patients. Helps with heart health. I've seen triglycerides go down a lot with patients fasting. Helps with brain health. So fasting, you get this brain drive neurotrophic factor, BDNF. People take supplements to boost this. They do all kinds of things to boost this, to reduce their risk of neurological diseases. Well, you could just fast. Like it's free to fast. It's just, we have this problem with food, right? And sometimes I'll like, be like, I'm going to go into a long fast. And then like, I pull out, well, I don't shame myself for that. I'm like, okay, I'll get it next time. It's fine. A lot of times with fasting, first of all, it's nice to do fasting, like with people, like sometimes I'm the only one doing it in my family. And I think that's like hard. Sometimes I have to like put out on social media, like I'm going to do a fast. So I can at least someone can hold me responsible. <laughs> it's not easy. This stuff is not easy, but it, it becomes easier when you do it. And then you love it because you feel better. So cellular health and longevity, you're going to increase that autophagy. You're taking out your trash. So many people, I can look at people and I'm just like, oh my gosh, they're toxic. They need to take out their cellular trash. You can just see it in their faces and see it in their, their body type. And it's not their fault. They're stuck. They're probably insulin resistant. Their body is not going through proper autophagy. So all of these senescent zombie cells are just hanging out in their body, causing wrecking havoc and inflammation. Yes, it's a thing. It's, it's sad. Hormone regulation, it's going to help with balance out your hormones and increase growth hormones, cancer prevention. And some studies it's saying that intermittent fasting can help reduce the growth of cancers, improve gut health because you're giving your gut a rest. It's resting, it's repairing. So then when you eat again, it gets better. I, if, I, if I'm feeling wonky in the GI area, I try to fast. I'll do like a liquid fast if I'm in my luteal phase. So there's a lot of different things you can play around with better mental clarity. I am so sharp when I fast. I was telling my patients, I fast Monday and Wednesdays. I'll just have, um, coffee with MCT oil on it, which increases my ketones more and butter. And I'll fast until like three or four every Monday and Wednesday. Cause I am so clear on those ketones. My brain loves the ketones. So whatever my patients are handing at me, I I'm good. I'm clear. I'm not foggy, um, for them. So improved immune function. We know that fasting is great for our immune system. It's helping the immune system through autophagy and also helping gut health. And then animal studies have shown intermittent fasting can increase lifespan. And this is still up for debate. There's always drama with this, but if you're, if you're doing it properly and you're reducing those metrics of inflammation, that's going to help with longevity. So fasting, different durations, they all provide benefit. So if you're not ready for a 36 hour fast, try a 12 hour fast, 12 hour fast minimum every night. I recommend this gives digestive rest. So this is going to help with gut health. So many patients have leaky gut or intestinal permeability, inflammation in the gut. You're going to start having ketosis. So the body might start to use the stored glycogen and transition to fat burning for energy. Who doesn't like to burn fat? Improve sleep. I've seen this on my aura ring, which is what I wear to help track metrics. I eat, if I eat a late dinner or if I'm eating before bed, I'm going to have an increased heart rate and my sleep is not going to be as good. 24 hour fasts are, are really nice. I think it's very doable. Sometimes, you know, I'll stop eating. I'll eat an early dinner around five, five thirty. Then I just won't eat until the next dinner. And that one I find easier to do, especially as a mother and someone that cooks dinner for their family, you get enhanced fat burning. So it increases the fat oxidation, more autophagy. So you're having cellular repair processes increasing at 24 hours and reducing inflammation. So just at the 24 hour mark, you're having a decrease in the inflammatory markers. 36 hours. I think this is a great fast for fat burning and 
it's more difficult. You just have to not cook dinner that night for your family. I have gone for a lot of 36 hour fasts and it was cooking dinner for my family. It just doesn't work. I, you just got to peace out or you can take your kids out to eat somewhere where you don't like. I've done that before, taking them to, you know, Chick-fil-A or something where I'm not like tempted to eat anything there. So that's an option. Your body is in a deeper state of ketosis, burning more stored fat. That's why it's so good for fat loss. This is really helpful for resetting that insulin sensitivity. A lot of people are stuck and they can't break through or lose weight when they've been dieting for so long. So I tell them, throw in a couple 36 hour fasts, like one or two a month and see how you do. That might really push you through because you can't lose weight when you're insulin resistant. It's basically impossible. So it's really hard. I wouldn't, I shouldn't say impossible. If you just didn't eat for 30 days, you would burn all your muscle, but that wouldn't be good. So this is a great breakthrough 36 hour fast. And I would use a continuous glucose monitor, especially if you're new to fasting, or if you're on any medications, <laughs> sorry, of course you want to talk with your, your personal doctor improve mental clarity at that 24 hour mark. After you go past that, you are, you're clear. You want to get stuff done, do it on a fast. <clears throat> Sorry, <clears throat> 48 hour fast. This one is great because you're having a growth hormone surge, and this is going to help preserve that muscle and that, and so in the growth of the muscle, so you're not going to do too much damage. Your body has this protective mechanism in place. You're going to have continued deeper autophagy, and you're going to have almost a reset of the gut health at 48 hours in three days, a three day water fast. You're going to have the immune system regeneration and this is just like a reboot for the immune system. You're going to have really significant therapeutic ketosis. You're also going to have some detoxification. If you're doing a longer fast like this, you really need to be doing a liver cleanse before. And when I work with my patients and my clients, we do, we talk about how's your liver health, because we would never want to do something dangerous where we're mobilizing all these toxins, but your body can't deal with them well fat does protect you. It stores toxins because it's protecting you. And then at five days, you're going to have enhanced cellular protection. It's just, this is the one where there's possible, you know, they're trying to study this more in humans that we're having this stem cell regeneration in animal studies. And that's amazing. I have not done a five day. I would really have to like not work or do a lot with my kids. I mean, this, you couldn't just do normal life on a five day water cleanse, you would have to like give yourself some grace and some time off. So that one, um, should be done under medical supervision also, but fasting as a woman, you know, I think we need to really look at our hormones and fast around our menstrual cycle so we can protect our progesterone and our other sex hormones. So this is a great chart to come back to. And this is one that I hand out to my patients in the menstrual phase, going into follicular phase, follicular phase is the best time to do those longer fasts and to fast. And this is also a good time to be in ketosis. It's a good time to do those HIIT workouts if you want to be really social to be high energy. I know I personally like day four, I'm like ready to go. I feel so good. I want to hit the gym hard. I, you know, I can do keto. I can do my longer fasts and be successful at them. Ovulation can be lower carb, but you don't really want to do any crazy, um, fast around here. Luteal phase, that second half of your cycle, you're having a rising, then a falling of progesterone. You want to protect that progesterone. You don't want to do things like HIIT workout that is going to tank your progesterone and via the cortisol steel, we like to call it. You can add in more complex carbs. You're going to be craving carbs. When I eat carbs, when I'm in my luteal phase, I don't feel guilty. I, first of all, I know that my body needs some more complex carbs. I want to protect that progesterone. And I also know that I'm going to do fasting in my follicular phase and go back into ketosis and it's, and it's fine. 
where, where I hit pitfalls and my patients hit pitfalls is when we start doing a lot of sugar around that. Cause you are going to crave the sugar more. So that's where I really like protein powders or making things that, um, you know, they satisfy that sweet tooth, but they're not going to be detrimental to my overall goal. There are some caveats with intermittent fasting. I did have a patient who came to me and she'd already been intermittent fasting. She was fasting until lunch. She felt good doing this, but she was gaining weight. And she was like, why am I gaining weight intermittent fasting? Everyone else is losing weight. So I'm like, let's put on a continuous glucose monitor. She was getting huge insulin spikes at breakfast time, even though she wasn't eating. So she started eating protein and fat for breakfast as I directed her to. And then she started losing weight. She lost three dress sizes just by gaining those glucose spikes under control. Her, it was just interesting because she felt good fasting. We wouldn't have known without the continuous glucose monitor. So I want you guys to just write down during Q and a, we can talk about this more, you know, why aren't you fasting? Have you ever fasted? You know, what, what is getting in your way of good health? Because we all have, whether they're mental blocks, strongholds, you know, we all have things. And maybe you just need a guide. You don't know how to do it. You, or you need someone to push you or you need someone to tell you what to do could be all of those. Family could be a reason. Stress, like I'm too stressed out. I just don't want to think about another thing. Work, maybe you have a job that you don't think that you'd be able to fast or you wouldn't do well with it. I will say that I love fasting on night shift. It's just, I feel good doing it. I take my electrolytes. I take my teas. I have snacks just in case, but now that I'm more metabolically flexible, you don't need to just eat all the time. And that's one thing you'll, you'll find it's, it's almost freedom when you get metabolically flexible and your blood sugar stable, and you can switch from ketosis to burning glucose to burning ketones you're not going to like stress about needing food, right? You're not going to be like, what if I'm stranded and there's nothing to eat and there's only McDonald's and I feel like I'm not going to be okay. And I have to get my, or, you know, something like that. You're just not going to, or you carry fat snacks, like, you know, keto bricks or beef sticks in your car or you're, or you just know you can wait. So it's really, it feels really good once you get in this pattern you could have strongholds. These could be mental strongholds. Like I can't do that. Like I don't have the willpower to do that. I, I can't not eat for 24 hours. Yes, you can. You can, you can, there's electrolytes. You could have MCT oil and coffee. You can have a lot of different things. There's a lot of different tools now. <coughs> Excuse me. Genetics. I can't, I can't fast. I have, I'm hypoglycemic or genetics. You know, everyone had diabetes. I can't do this. That's not true. You you can break through genetics, your genetics. So genetics load the gun, but environment pulls the trigger. We hear that expression a lot in integrative medicine and functional medicine. And it's true. It's good and it's helpful to know the genetics. Like I ask all of my clients about their genetics, but it doesn't, it just helps guide me a little bit to make sure we're not missing anything. It doesn't mean that I don't think that they can be healthy. We're going to do a peptide loss, weight loss, peptide crash course real quick, because this is something that comes up a lot. So I wanted to talk about it with you guys. I love peptides. They're fun. I've been using peptides for years. They are not this brand new thing that Big Pharma makes you think is just brand new. They've been around. Insulin is a peptide. Oxytocin is a peptide. Growth hormone is a peptide. These are all things that we make in our own body. And peptides are characterized as short chains of amino acids. So 50 or less make up a peptide. And what they do is they operate in the body once they get in, usually subcutaneous. Also, they can be oral. They function in cellular sign signaling, neurotransmission, hormone regulation, and a lot of other physiological processes. GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide 1, is one that is on the news all the time. This is just 
known as the shot. I was talking to someone about they're like, they just call it the weight loss shot. I'm like, okay, it's a peptide. Brand names Ozempic um, and Wagovi. So Ozempic is the big one. So semi-glutide is the generic name. It's an incretin hormone secreted by the intestine in response to food intake, secreted by the L cells in the intestines and responsible for in response to food intake, and it stimulates insulin secretion from the pancreatic beta cells in a glucose dependent manner, meaning it enhances insulin release when blood sugar levels are high. And it inhibits glucagon secretion from the pancreatic alpha cells, reducing the blood glucose level. It slows the gastric emptying, leading to an increased satiety and reduced appetite. A lot of my patients say that it takes away that food noise that they're always hearing. And it's, and it really helps them focus on good nutrition. And in addition to it, it's effects on insulin and glucagon, it may be beneficial on cardiovascular health and weight management. There's also GLP ones, GIPs. GIP is glucose dependent insulin otrophic peptide. And it's similar action, except also there's some secretion, the K cells in the intestine in response to food intake, glucose and fat but it also stimulates insulin secretion from the pancreatic beta cells. It's glucose dependent also, and it enhances that glucose release all again. And then it also contributes to lipid metabolism and energy storage. So this is brand name terzepatide, or terzepatide is a generic name and brand name Manjaro and Zetbound, and this is also subcutaneous. This one tends to have a little bit more bang for your buck. You get a little bit more weight loss, I would say with terzepatide. And I've had patients that have not have failed, um, semi-glutide and then we put them on terzepatide and they do really well. Contraindications, personal or family history of medullary thyroid cancer and multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome type one relative or pancreatitis gastroparesis. And you could get as side effects, <clears throat> pancreatitis gastroparesis. We've seen suicidal ideations, GERD reflux, and also return of the weight. And these are just some studies. The step one trial extension showed weight regain and cardiometabolic effects after withdrawal of semi-glutide. So this one was basically saying you have to be on this forever. Then they did a study. The Chinese study was interesting, and that was on semi-glutide. And they were saying that semi-glutide can reduce the weight and fat of obese patients while maintaining muscle mass and muscle strength. So we are seeing a bunch of the studies, different things. Most of the studies are saying, because they're by drug companies, oh, we need, you need to be on this forever. But it's not really necessarily what we're seeing with patients that have insulin resistance in the real world. We are seeing that if they are doing basically everything I spoke about, eating lots of protein, lifting weights, they are doing really well with this. It does reset their, their glucose resist, their insulin resistance and the glucose problem. It just really helps. And it, like I said, it takes away that food noise too, especially if they're one of those patients that they can't do the 36 hour fast or they fail at it, or they are eating perfectly. Sometimes this really helps reset. And Peptides, I think are great like this when they're used for three to four months and then you go off of them and you rotate them. It's nothing that we should just have the gas pedal on all the time. Dosing, I, I like it compounded better because you can titrate it better and you're not getting the nausea because what can happen is with the nausea, you could not be drinking water and you could have kidney issues with that. So compounded we titrate up slowly to the two milligrams, you usually start at 0.25 milligrams and go up. And then compounded usually 2.5 milligrams, you start out for, for the terzepatide and go up to a max of 10. I also love pairing GLP ones with things like growth hormone secretagogues. And these stimulate the secretion of growth hormone from the pituitary gland. They are not growth hormone, they're growth hormone secretagogues. So these are great to pair with the semi-glutide for muscle mass and strength. I also like 5-amino-1-MQ. It's a mitochondrial peptide. It's great to pair with semi-glutide and terzepatide. It gives, it helps with lipolysis and also energy, mitochondrial energy. 
And then a little bit more in depth with berberine. Once again, I, this is great. A lot of social media, I guess, is saying that it's a natural GLP one. Yes. And no, it works a little bit different, but it's also really, really helpful. You just have to be careful if you're on berberine really, really long-term it does, it can be used to kill off certain gut bacteria. So that's why you want to work with your doctor and make sure that they are keeping an eye on that. And there's that, that we went over. Okay. So now what I told you guys that there is an opportunity to work with me really closely one-on-one, -on -one, and this will be a very unique opportunity. And I only have a few spots that I'm opening up because of my current schedule. This would be your chance to work with me. What you would get is four coaching sessions. That would be four coaching sessions, just one-on-one -on -one with me. Two programs, you would get the six-week weight loss program, and you would also get access to the full cycle syncing program. You would get curated supplements that I think would be helpful to kickstart your weight loss, and not only weight loss, but more so your glucose, your insulin resistance, your glucose problem. And also this would include functional lab work. The functional lab work, we would look at hormones, insulin, and thyroid. So this is a life-changing opportunity. And I have found that I love doing free education and I will always give free education, free resources online. The things where I really see patients changing is when they financially commit. They financially commit to fit changing their lives where they put down the money to work with me. They put down the money for the courses, for the supplements, and they're ready to go. It's kind of like if you were giving a free gym membership, you probably wouldn't go. But if you were paying $200 a month for the gym membership, you are going to be going because otherwise you're wasting your money. So once again, you get the intro session. We're going to be getting, doing lab work and courses we're gonna be doing reviewing this lab work and then making changes based on that. We're gonna be implementing supplements, follow-up session and wrap up. And how do we get in? Let me put the link here in the chat. Let's see here, everyone in the meeting. Okay. So for this, this is an introductory price because only you guys are on this live. I'm going to increase the price tomorrow to 4999. So you get a savings tonight because you guys are here. What you want to do, if you guys are interested at all with working with me one-on-one, -on -one, and I am going to close this to probably only five of you because of time. And I really want to give my all to everyone. So once you click on that link here in the chat, you will see this, this is the glucose and hormone balancing. And I already told you guys what you're going to get. Your, the testing is awesome. It's weight management and thyroid CRT labs. So it's saliva and finger prick. So you don't have to go to the lab or anything, and it will get shipped to your home. The only state I cannot do this with is New York. So sorry if you're in New York. They're a little bit interesting there. You will scroll down and hit next. And then you will see this, and you will see the discounted price for tonight. You will enter in your first name and your email address. And if you want to say you're gonna, you hear, heard about this, through the masterclass. That's totally fine. Cause I will be offering this to everyone starting tomorrow. And you would pay now you put in your information and then you're going to get an email. It's going to say, welcome to practice better. You're all in there. And then we are going to start scheduling our sessions together. I have openings in my schedule for the afternoons. If you email me or send me a message on practice better is like I signed up, but evenings are better for me or weekends or mornings. I, I can totally work with you. That is why I'm leaving room in my schedule for this. So once again, this is, I told you there would be a chance to work with me. This is what I've put together. And I really want to take 
a handful of clients and work one-on-one because that's my passion. I love teaching, but I also really like working one-on-one with all of you. And now we will go to Q and A's. I do want to drop some other links in here in the chat. The first one is for the coaching package. The second one is for a continuous glucose monitor. If you want to go ahead and get a continuous glucose monitor, you do not need to ask your doctor for one. This tastermonial, if you go to that link, you can click on there and then basically you you pay for a prescription and then you can go and take that to your pharmacy and it's, it's really simple. That's how I get my continuous glucose monitors. Cause I don't, I don't know if the doctor I go to would write me one and I don't like conventional really medicine doctors. Um, cause they, they don't listen. I got fired from my last one. Then there's also a link for the berberine. So the berberine that is what you can take before meals, also apple cider vinegar. Those are the things that you can take. Cause what you do to get the semi-glutide and the GLP ones, you have to work with the doctor. But I also don't think that is something that you should just jump into. You need to do the prep work. I also have a six week weight loss course that goes through in detail what we spoke about. It's also really helpful. It's on my Practice Better website too. That is a good prep work if you are thinking about going on a GLP one. Cause let's be honest, you can just go online and, and get that, get that anywhere. I mean, I get advertisements for it all the time. So that is another thing that you might want to think about prepping. That's why I have a six week weight loss course. I, I put patients through that first before we even talk about semi-glutide or something like terzepatide. Does anyone have any questions? If you, you can type them in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Oh, there's some in the chat here. So I, uh, someone said they were diagnosed with Lyme disease four years ago in a wreck. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you would feel like a wreck. So Lyme disease is something where we, we want to get the gut health imbalance. Yes. We want to get the, the blood sugar imbalance because you are in that sympathetic fight or flight state. When we have a stealth infection, we're not regulated from an autonomic standpoint and cortisol and stress can cause that blood sugar to be erratic. So it's kind of hard to juggle that, but if you're eating really clean and healthy and improving that or wearing a monitor and seeing what the triggers are, that would be really helpful. Berberine made bloat and cause constipation. So with berberine, first of all, where, where's the source? Sometimes we get supplements and I, I wouldn't recommend people getting supplements from Amazon. You don't know how they're stored, how long they're in the warehouse. I, it, you don't know if they're adultered, they're coming in from China. You just don't know. So that could be why also it could be, you have some sort of dysbiosis or imbalance in the gut. And what that means is that berberine, cause you know, it's made of golden seal and that is antimicrobial. So you could be just stirring up something that was going on like a SIBO or intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Yeah. Monk fruit is the uh, sweetener. You have to be careful because a lot of the monk fruit is combined with erythritol and it's, it's so annoying because, because it says monk fruit, but it's really erythritol with a little bit of monk fruit. How often do you recommend fasting daily, intermittent fasting or periods of time? I think I kind of went over that. You know, it depends too on the patients and how long after addressing insulin resistance, do we see results? So it, de it depends. It depends on if you're working with someone that can guide you. My patients, we, we definitely see results within a couple months and it's very rewarding. And how do I know what phase, um, of my cycle I'm in because I've had four periods in four years. So if your period, yes, disappeared due to health reasons, this, the, and a very important vital sign of health is your hormones and having a regular cycle until you go to met menopause naturally. If you're not having cycles that are normal, then you probably need to work with someone like me. And this is where the one-on-one -on -one coaching comes in. I mean, you're 
you're not going to get that answer going to the conventional doctor because they don't know about hormones. I had a patient today, saw me for acne, found out she had Hashimoto's and we're working on that. We're working in steps. She has candida overgrowth. So we're working on that. But she came back to me after six weeks because we were going over functional testing and her skin was perfectly clear. It was fabulous. We did some peptides and we added some supplements. We started wearing a continuous glucose monitor. So it's all these pieces and it's just beautiful when they come all together, but it, it takes someone with, with expertise to be able to look at those. Okay. Let me see here. There's a few more questions. What about fasting while breastfeeding? That is something that you don't want to do any long fast while breastfeeding. You could definitely do the 12 hour fasting. You could do the 18 hour fasting. I usually say after the baby starts eating solid food, you could do a little bit longer fast depending on your milk supply. Cause you don't want your milk supply to drop. Also, you want to make sure the thyroid is optimal before you start doing that while breastfeeding. Can you feel unsteady and you're walking with insulin resistance, trying to figure out if I have Hashimoto's inner ear insulin resistance? Yeah, you can feel a little bit dizzy or off balance because if you're going up and down your blood glucose and you're having those ups and downs, another thing, if, if you have really high blood sugars or insulin resistance, high insulin, you're going to have inflammation. And I see with patients, a lot of the times, if we address the inflammation, they're not having that, the inner ear inflammation, they're not having as much inflammation. Um, molecular mimicry could be yes for, so Hashimoto's and no thyroid. Yeah. So you're still making antibodies to your thyroid. So that means that there's probably something going on with the immune system or the gut still, and that needs to be addressed. You know, if you have autoimmunity, you really need to address the gut health. So Katie, the weight loss program, I will drop that in the chat. I have to find it. That is another link that I could find for you. And that is, you're not going to get the coaching. Let me see, where is it? It should be on the same page. Here's the cycle syncing. I will give you that if I can find my chat again. Okay. It should be on the same course page. If you go to, if you go to healthy by Dr. Jen, and if you go to work with us, then you will see all the courses there because there there are just courses there that you could go through and lots of information, you know, a little bit different from what we did tonight, but more detail. All right, awesome. All right, well, is anyone, I, I hope some of you signed up to work with me and I will be keeping this open probably through next week in case anyone does want to work with me and then I'm gonna shut it down. After that, I, I have that peptide summit and I'm going to, to be working with people on peptides for that. So I, I hope some of you take advantage of this. I don't always open, I don't always have time to bring on new patients. Uh, April, yes, if you want to do payment plan, just send me a message and you can shoot me an email and I can work that out with you, okay? All right. Thank you, everyone. I will put this up on YouTube and then we can, um, you guys can share it with friends, whether you think it might help. And really the taste ceremonial, it's great to wear a continuous glucose monitor. And I would also recommend wearing it a full cycle, full menstrual cycle if you're menstruating. All right. Yes, of course. All right. Any other questions? All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night.